Good morning, everybody. A little louder, please. Good morning. All right, you know a little about me. I don't know anything about you. How many of you are educators, past, present, or future? Raise your hands. Aha. How many of you are parents? Raise your hands. How many of you are concerned citizens? Raise your hands. Trick question, but you got it. Good. Be more than, it could be all three. Well, I'm all three. I'm actually even a grandparent. How many of you were in my talk yesterday afternoon? Raise your hands. Most of you. Good. So I'm going to recap very, very quickly. And you guys might want to start the timer. Otherwise, I'll take the entire morning. There you go. So recapping briefly. While the unemployment rate appears to have gone down, it's 7.3%, lower at any time in the last four years, it, it really hides a lot of more significant data. Only 63% of all Americans have jobs today or are looking for jobs. The lowest number since 1978 when women began to come into the labor force in significant numbers. Point two, the kinds of jobs people are getting are being created or tend to be minimum wage service and retail jobs. Even a college degree no longer guarantees you decent employment. What I've been discovering is that the percentage of recent college graduates, four-year college graduates, who are unemployed or underemployed is 54%. Underemployed being defined as having jobs that don't require a BA and don't pay BA degree wages. Median family income declined 10% in the last decade. I talked yesterday about the importance of developing the dispositions of being an innovator for our kids' futures, for, the, for them to have secure jobs, and for a more secure economic future for an entire country. And I defined innovation as someone who is a creative problem solver. And finally, I talked about the dispositions of, of an innovator and how they're developed, and how the culture of learning to develop the capacity to innovate is fundamentally and radically at odds with a culture of schooling. I emphasize particularly the importance of learning to make mistakes and to fail as a part of the process of being an innovator. I also talked about the importance of intrinsic motivation, things that rarely get developed in our schools, and particularly the importance of play, passion, and purpose in the development of intrinsic motivation. What I want to talk about today, above and beyond all of those things, are the new skills all students need for work, learning, and citizenship, and the implications for completely reimagining the outcomes that matter most and therefore our assessment and accountability systems. A number of years ago, I read Thomas Friedman's book, The World is Flat. How many of you read that book? Raise your hands. Many of you. Good. Scared the heck out of me, frankly, because it's the first book I had ever read where I really began to understand the extent to which jobs are being outsourced, automated, reinvented, blown up, started over. I talked to Tom recently. He said, you know, I got something wrong in that book. I said, what? He said, the pace of change. So much more quick than he had ever imagined. And it's not just blue-collar jobs that are being outsourced, offshored, automated. Law, you know, 30% drop in the applicants to law schools in the last few years. Because the likelihood that somebody who's a newly minted lawyer is going to pay back their loans now, lower and lower every year. So knowing this, I began a quest. I wanted to try to understand what were the skills that matter most in this new economy, and what are the gaps. I talked to a wide range of executives, literally, from Apple to Unilever. I talked to leaders of the US military. I talked to community leaders. I talked to college teachers. I did focus groups with recent graduates, asking them what they saw as the gaps in their own education. And I came to understand that there's a set of core competencies. Every young person must be well on the way to mastering, not just to get and keep a good job, but equally important to be a lifelong learner and to be an active and informed citizenship. This is not just a matter of teaching kids workplace skills. Let me be clear. The skills for work, the skills for learning, and the skills for citizenship have converged probably for the first time in human history. What are they? I call them the seven survival skills. Number one, critical thinking and problem solving. Over and over again, I've come to understand the leaders of any sector, big business, small business, nonprofit, expect all of their employees to think continuously about how to improve their product, their process, or their service, to be a problem solver. But when I ask these executives, what do they mean by critical thinking, it got kind of interesting. Because you know, for us, it's a buzzword. 
You, if you'd asked me a decade ago, what is critical thinking? I would have gone, well, yes, critical thinking is sort of like thinking critically. It's a kind of a circular thing, really. We have not been held accountable for defining it. So rarely do you walk into a school and see a group of teachers who have a clear understanding of what it means and what it looks like in student work. And if it's not there, it's not taught. But over and over again, what these executives told me, and it was the most common answer I got, critical thinking begins with the ability to ask the right questions, to ask really good questions. Not memorize the right answers, get the right questions. Collaboration across networks and leading by influence is the seven, second core competency. Increasingly, all work is being done collaboratively, except in education, of course. It's another story. More and more, in fact, it's being done virtually. I did a Skype yesterday with 650 educators uh, from Bogota, Colombia. I talked to folks at IBM, and they explained how when they have a new problem to solve, a new client, they quite intentionally create a team from their different centers around the world that work virtually because they want to create solutions that will work in more than one culture or country. But the way th those teams are led is profoundly different. It, they are no longer led by supervisors telling people what to do. They are led by peers through influence. And they're an incredibly diverse team. So you have, must have a deep appreciation for differences as you lead your peers through influence. Third survival skill, agility and adaptability. The pace of change, the complexity of problems, simply demands that we be far more agile and adaptable, in radical contrast to the regularities of school, which hardly demand any of those qualities. Fourth survival skill, initiative and entrepreneurialism. Now, it was Mark Chandler, who was then general counsel and vice president of Cisco Systems, who talked with me about how executives like him lay awake at night worrying about keeping that entrepreneurial spirit and sense of initiative alive. He said something quite striking to me. He said, if I have an employee who sets and meets five goals, a good little doobie, having jumped through all the hoops, no longer good enough. He said, if on the other hand, I have an employee who sets 10 stretch goals, but maybe only succeeds at seven or eight, he or she is a hero. But what would that person be as a student in our schools having missed two or three out of 10? C, B student. Having taken a risk? Fifth survival skill, effective oral and written communication, and it is the number one complaint of both employers and college teachers. But it was Mike Summers, a senior executive at Dell Computer, who put an interesting spin on it for me. He said, you know why these kids can't write? He's talking about college graduates. Because they don't know how to think. They don't know how to reason. And he said, that's only half the problem. The other half of the problem, he told me, and being a recovering high school English teacher, this sort of was so dear to my heart. He said, I quote, they do not know how to write with voice, meaning to put their own passion and perspective into their communications so as to be persuasive. Sixth survival skill, accessing and analyzing information. Right here, on every internet connected device, growing exponentially, changing constantly. How many of you had to memorize the periodic table in high school? Raise your hands. Come on, we all did. You may have just had a bad year and don't remember. So you can tell me how many elements there are, right? Come on, shout out that answer. Geez, I, did you hear that? I didn't hear that. Well, whatever number you came up with is dead wrong because two more were added last month. And could we have a moment of silence for Pluto, please, really? <laughs> for all those years being in the club, it's just not fair. How many of our kids graduate from high school knowing how to do an effective internet search, how to ask a good question, and analyze, evaluate the results, and then apply them to a problem they're solving or something they're trying to understand, especially given how the internet is filtered in almost every school in America, unlike Finland, by the way. Last survival skill, curiosity and imagination. Now, it was Dan Pink who wrote a book, as you may know, called A Whole New Mind, where he talked about curiosity and imagination and right brain skills being increasingly important in a more sophisticated consumer economy, where we are demanding uh, more beautiful products, more empathetic services. But I've come to see the need for curiosity and imagination in the radically different light of an innovation economy where we need to graduate all students innovation ready, ready to solve problems creatively. And the bedrock of that, the bedrock of that capacity to be a creative problem solver is curiosity and imagination. Not even primarily for a consumer economy, but to solve the most pressing problems we face as a species on the planet.
beginning with sustainability. So this book came out, The Global Achievement Gap, five years ago, four and a half, I guess now, and suddenly something began to happen in my life, rather surprised me. I began getting invitations to speak from all around the world, from Taiwan to Singapore to Thailand to Australia to uh, Panama to Spain to England to Finland, from West Point to Wall Street. And the stunning thing that, that really shocked me was how much agreement there was around these survival skills. Over and over again, leadership audiences said to me, yep, these are exactly the right skills. Two months ago, I spoke to Fortune 200 CEOs, and after I finished speaking, Jeff Bezos, founder of Amazon, got up and said, you nailed it. These are exactly the skills. So they are still the most important skills. Executives over and over again say to me, you know, I can teach them the content, and I'm going to have to because it's going to change constantly. But I can't teach them how to think or reason or communicate effectively. So very briefly, I want to talk with you about the implications. Then I want to show you this fabulous video. My friend and I, Ted Dentersmith, are working on a feature-length documentary film that come out early next year about education in the 21st century, what it must look like. What does it look like when these things I'm describing are actually taught and assessed? But before I do that, let me get clear here. We have to become advocates of the outcomes that matter most. The problem with our accountability 1.0 system is that we are measuring things with predominantly factual recall, multiple choice tests that tell us absolutely nothing about college, work, or citizenship readiness in the 21st century. They are virtually useless, except for very, very basic aware sort of testing of, of literacy, the three R's. The problem is the three R's are not enough. We need the four C's, critical thinking, collaboration, communication, creative problem solving. We need to advocate for accountability 2.0. All of us. I want to see a button or a bumper sticker with every educator saying, hold me accountable for what matters most. What does accountability 2.0 look like? Very briefly, we would use selectively a few tests, like the college and work readiness assessment, which is a test of skills, or the school-based PISA test. By selectively, I mean that these tests are more expensive. We don't have to test every kid every year to have accountability. We can use an auditing or sampling strategy, as most countries in the world do, as PISA, PISA does, the Program for International Student Assessment. But we also have to understand that what counts isn't always what can be counted. So I want to see every student have a digital portfolio that follows them through school. I want to see students collect evidence of mastery of the skills that matter most, beginning with the four C's that I just mentioned. I want to see teachers have a digital portfolio. Should teachers be accountable? Yes. But to a multiple choice test in May that students themselves are not accountable for, that is a recipe to drive our best educators out of the profession, out of it. Rather, we should be held accountable for evidence of progress in our students' work over the course of the year or several years in our digital portfolios. Finally, to the issue of student motivation, I want to see every student have 20% time, what we call FedEx time in their classrooms. I want students to know when they start school, they're going to be the architects of their own learning for 20% of their time. They're going to be able to design their own lessons, to ask their own questions and investigations. This is not free time. They're going to be held accountable in their digital portfolios. And we're going to conference with them and talk with them about their learning goals and then help them to assess and, and reflect on what they learned and what their new learning goals are. So that, in brief, is what I see as the essential task before us, to advocate with business and community leaders for a higher form of accountability that incents powerful teaching and learning around the outcomes that matter most. If we do not do that, our country, our economy, will be in more and more jeopardy every single year. And Common Core isn't going to solve the problem because it's still way too much multiple choice, way too little application of real knowledge. I also happen to think that the Common Core math standards are ludicrous at the high school level. How many solved for a polynomial in the last week? How are you doing on factoring quadratic equations? Raise your hands. The math that matter most is statistics, probability, computation, estimation, financial literacy. But none of that is in the Common Core. Why? I asked David Coleman. He said, yeah, well, we lost that battle. Common Core is tied to college admission standards that are totally obsolete. College admissions use that advanced math, not because everybody will need it, but because it's a very convenient way of screening kids out. I'm sick of it. OK. On to better things. 
told you we've been working on this feature length documentary. We've been hanging out a lot at High Tech High in San Diego. Anybody know that school? It's a charter school network. There are 12 schools, 4,500 kids. They also have their own graduate school of education. A couple remarkable things about that school. You only get in by a lottery, and it's done by zip code. So the school is absolutely representative of the San Diego demographics, meaning it's about 60% minority, about 48% free and reduced. They send 97% of their kids to college. Uh, four years ago, they sent more kids to Stanford than any other non-legacy high school. Also important to know what they don't have. They don't have AP courses. They don't teach the state test. Their state test scores are average. They don't have varsity athletics. They've made some choices. So I, I want to show this film to you, and then we'll, I'm looking forward to the Q&A, because I think it's important that we get us to smell, touch, and taste, and feel what the classroom of the future can and must look like. Can we roll that film now, please? The philosophy of High Tech High is founded largely on the idea of kids making, doing, building, shaping, and inventing stuff. The engineers that I know, the architects I know, the artists I know, uh, the great educators that I know, the entrepreneurs that I know, are all sort of perplexed and curious about how they can do it better the next time. And that type of perplexity leads to engagement, it leads to learning, it leads to innovation. We are trying to have that type of perplexity and curiosity get inculcated in our students in everyday practices. Lincolnbit and Qualcomm, one of our problems was being able to hire enough qualified people, enough trained people. And so it was kind of a long-term view to set up High Tech High. Oh, I don't think it's at the blue one. I think I know what's wrong. And... Like if you have tooth spacing in point zero one, the teeth, the gears won't connect at all. We didn't know that it was all going to work until maybe four weeks before the exhibition. Yeah. Three weeks. I mean, I mean, we knew we knew that pieces of it were working, right? And even those pieces were impressive. We had to learn about civilizations, the Mayans, the Romans, and the Greeks. And Scott and Mike didn't want to just teach us this, so they came up with this big wheel, which is a big gear, which has a lot of drawings on it, and it's connected to all these other mechanisms, and they each represented our theory. So um, I learned about the Mayans, the Greeks, and the Romans, and I really based my theory off of the Romans. Mm -hmm. and, and why so? Because it has to do with expanding. They were always expanding, mm -hmm. and I what I realized is that they're expanding not because, you know, not just for the fun of it, but they needed resources mm -hmm. for all the people back home mm -hmm. in Italy and all the ones that they, um, all the new places that they took over. Then they had to, on their own, develop and defend an idea on why they think civilizations rise and fall. So we had to create like a flow chart just explaining what our theory was, and then we got critiques on it, um, and then we created a group one. Another piece is on the mechanical side. They need to take what's already an abstract concept with their theory, and they have to take that and actually physically manifest it. They have some very preliminary metrics they need to use. They know that there's going to be a big wheel turning at a certain RPM. They know how many teeth that is, so they have basically a box to work within, some bounds to work within, and they have to make everything. Yeah, can get it. Oh, I put the wrong side in. Oh my god. Oh my god. So we have an exhibition that we're preparing for right now, and it'll be tomorrow night, and there will be thousands of people here looking at student work, uh, students presenting their work, visitors looking at the work. Um, students presenting their work to each other. And I think that idea of making work public, that's a missing piece to me 
in schools in general. For most of you, this is probably the biggest project that you've ever exhibited. A lot of you, it's the first project that you've ever really had a public exhibition of. All right? Cool. We're going to be here. If you need to go, we understand, but we're going to keep working for a few hours. Break. This idea of sort of making something and having a public exhibition and having people come look at it and you have that feeling that we all have like how did they do that You really need to understand it and you really need to understand why you need to know this to be able to complete the project. What astounded me was that while doing research, my theory, it actually fit with a lot of these civilizations. It wasn't just like some random theory. When kids have that feeling, it's transformative for them. I made this and everyone's coming to look at it. Mm -hmm.